Confused and overwhelmed by social media? Wondering what the next big trend is? Would you like to get more clients and more sales through the power of social media? Welcome to the Social Media Mastery Podcast. Featuring your hosts, Daniel Dayette and Ricky Shetty. And a variety of social media experts covering the latest trends in social media. I'm here with Ricky Shetty, and uh, today, last week we talked about uh, Facebook, we talked about how to grow your following, we talked about the golden rule, and so if you really want to grow your Facebook following, really want to get money out of it, and uh, and you know, and also uh, get more engagement, please check out the previous episode. Uh, t- today's episode is sponsored by FunnelTracker.com, create a custom dashboard for your marketing and track any tools, software, webinars, etc., current episode today twitter do you feel like it's shouting in outer space uh how do you get exposure how do you get audience engagement and more so ricky why don't we start off by talking about strategy what's a great twitter strategy yeah definitely let's talk about that and uh you know uh, thanks everyone for listening and thanks to our sponsors final tracker uh, uh great to have them on board make sure you check out their website as well uh, in terms of twitter strategy I think it's uh, really developing a reason and a purpose of why you're on Twitter. Um, you, you know, there's a whole bunch of platforms, right? There's Facebook, there's Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, Google+, LinkedIn, Vine, and so on and so forth. So first question you need to answer is why Twitter? And I think, um, uh, firstly, I think most people should probably be on Facebook because almost everyone in the world is on Facebook. And then you've got to look at the platform sizes, um, so obviously, Facebook's, uh, I think, the biggest platform in the world. And then the next uh, biggest social media platforms include Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. So I think if you're trying to reach a massive audience of uh, people around the world or even locally, then I think Twitter is a place to be because you have a, a high potential of reaching a high number of people. Um, so why Twitter? Because that's where people are on. And um, I think uh, in terms of developing a strategy, it's figuring out what you want to achieve. Um, what do you want to achieve in terms of why are you on Twitter? Uh, is it because you're trying to actually sell things? Are you trying to build up your brand? Are you trying to create authority? Are you trying to uh, create valuable content through microblogging or micro tweets, right? 120 uh, characters. Um, are you trying to uh, maybe follow influential people? Are you trying to maybe uh, connect with uh, people in your network or industry? So you have to firstly answer that question. So once you answer that question, uh, you develop a strategy around it. Uh, so let's say, for example, you're trying to build up a following and uh, build up authority. Then you, uh, the strategy should be, let's build up our Twitter following. And we can talk about that, Daniel, um, uh, um, throughout this interview. But basically, uh, what I think we should cover is basically the strategy first, and then how do you build up your Twitter following? How can we get engagement? Because that's, like you said at the beginning, uh, sometimes it feels like you're shouting into outer space and no one can hear you. Uh, but actually, some people are really good at engaging and getting retweets and getting favorites and getting uh, 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 people to engage back and forth. So we can definitely, uh, you know, answer the listeners' questions about that. Um, and then finally, how do you convert? How do you actually money, make money? Can you make money with Twitter? Uh, so let's uh, let's go with any of those questions, Daniel. Yeah, for sure. So, like you said, uh, I mean, we can obviously you've kind of got to given an overview on the whole strategy concept like you know asking yourself why am i on here what am i going to do um let, let's dig in the first piece there like how do you grow a following mm-hmm. yeah great question daniel uh, i mean uh currently my twitter is at uh i'm just looking it up right now as we speak it's currently at sixteen thousand nine hundred and uh um you know uh 23 so by the time this episode airs live It'll probably be almost at the uh, 17,000 mark. And it's taken me about, uh, um, you know, I started in March of 2009. And uh, currently we are in June of 2016. So that's like a seven-year period to grow a following of 17,000. Um, uh, you know, obviously it took me um, that long. But I actually didn't uh, spend a lot of time in the beginning few years of, uh, of uh, you know, my time in Twitter. I was just basically just having an account for the sake of having an account. Because, you know, uh, all the cool kids have that, right? So I was like, okay, everyone has uh, Facebook and MySpace and uh, LinkedIn and YouTube. So uh, I might as well have a Twitter as well. 
but I didn't really start growing it until probably the last two or three years, honestly. So my first few years were around the thousand uh, thousand um, uh, follower mark, uh, then the two thousand follower mark, and really in the next last couple of years, it really jumped up over the ten thousand followers, the fifteen thousand followers, and I'm definitely going to hit twenty thousand followers by the end of the year. And uh, you know, it just up and up and up from there, and I'm pretty sure I'll hit fifty thousand, hundred thousand, and the more followers you have. Uh, the bigger your authority is, uh, the more credibility you have, uh, the more likelihood that people will uh, retweet you and engage with you. And finally, the more likely that you'll actually make some money by getting some customers. Um, so how did I get the following? Uh, let me share with you my strategies and feel free to jump in, Daniel, and share how you built up your following. Uh, but what I did is I basically firstly followed the maximum number of people which Twitter allows, which is actually 2,000. So you're allowed to just keep following until you reach 2,000. And then what happens is uh, Twitter uh, uh, doesn't allow you to follow anymore. Uh, so what you have to do is basically reach the 2,000. And then what I happened is I followed people in my industry or my niches or my areas of interest, which include, um, you know, entrepreneurship and business and social media and things to do with family and marriage and fatherhood. Those are my uh, kind of big passion areas. So I was following people who are like dad bloggers or mom bloggers. I was following social media influencers. And I was looking to follow people, not just super famous people, because what happens is a lot of people follow Obama and Kylie Minogue and uh, the Kardashians and Justin Bieber. And most likely, a lot of those people won't follow you back. Um, it depends, because some of those uh, people like Justin Bieber probably aren't managing um, their Twitter account themselves. They might have like a Twitter manager, and they might actually follow you back. So you might actually have... Uh, JB Justin Bieber uh, uh, follower back and that would be amazing right and make sure you capture that if Justin Bieber follows you back or Obama or any kind of one of your, your idols or gurus uh, make sure you screen capture that too because it's a it's a cool credibility builder that hey um, you know um, um, uh, you know name your celebrity he's following me back <laughs> so what I did is follow 2,000 people not celebrities but uh, more like uh, influencers and people who I felt would follow me back. And once you hit the 2000 cap, um, you basically have to start unfollowing people before you can follow more yourself. And the way you can do that is through a really cool app. Um, and I would like to give out tangible uh, resources for the listeners here on the podcast. Make sure you download this app. It's called Crowdfire. I'll uh, repeat it and I'll spell it out. Crowd fire like a crowd of people and fire like a, a flame so it's spelled c-r-o-w-d and then fire f-r-f-i-r-e if you go to your app store on um on um the apple store or on the android store or the blackberry store whichever your smartphone of choice is uh make sure you um download this app it's a brilliant app and it's free and there's a free version and a premium version it's kind of like the freemium model where you can get a free app and you can get a paid version of the app. Uh, but what, what happens is the free version allows you to actually unfollow people who are not following you back. And it's, uh, it's just easier, I find, than using Twitter directly to find out exactly who has unfollowed you, who doesn't follow you back, who's maybe blocked you, or who, uh, who, who you're following but they don't follow you back, or who's following you and you don't follow them back. So pretty much all the major metrics that you need to know, you can find through Crowdfire. Um, so what I did is I basically first hit the cap, like I said, the 2000 cap. And then um, um, I don't know exact numbers, but say about a thousand people followed me back. That means that a thousand people who didn't follow me back. So I would uh, go through the list and call a thousand people and then I'll be like, OK, now I have room to follow more. And I did that uh, pretty regularly in the, my first uh, years of uh, Twitter growth. Uh, that was my Twitter growth strategy. I would uh, uh, follow a whole bunch of people and then unfollow them and whoever follows me back uh, keep them obviously, uh, and then engage the people following me back. And then slowly I, I went, I hit the 2000, um, following and the 2000 followers. And, uh, there's a few, uh, different, uh, metrics you need to be aware of on Twitter. So firstly, and uh, Twitter is really good at about this. They tell you exactly the number of tweets you have. They, they tell you your following, they tell you who your followers, they tell you how many likes and how many lists you are uh, either a, a part of, or you, uh, have yourself. So, um, Ideally, the ratio between followers and following should be more or less the same. Ideally, you should have a bigger follow, uh, a greater number of people following you uh, than you are following back. Um, so you should try to increase the follower, followers number higher than the following number, if you get what I mean. Um, 
And then basically what happens is when you hit the 2000 cap and then two th- around 2000 people are following you back, that cap actually gets increased by Twitter. So then it might, uh, and I don't know exactly the numbers and how much they increase the cap, but it's roughly in the 200 uh, range uh, and then it goes up. So once you're 2000 and you have 2000 back, then I think they increase it to like 2200. And then for some reason, the numbers keep going up and, um, I don't know exactly. I don't know if you want to chime in here, Daniel, if you know those numbers, but, uh, uh, roughly, um, it, it's a 2,000 and a couple hundred uh, gap between followers and following. And I think it's a good um, system that Twitter has developed so that uh, the ratio of following and followers isn't too skewed. So it's not like you have 10,000 followers and only one or two people following you back or something, right? It will look really skewed. Um, so that's what I did, uh, uh, Daniel, to develop my uh, following. And like I said, as of today, when we're recording this podcast, is 16,900 and some change. Nice. You know, I had no idea, actually. You know, I've got about 1,500 followers right now. And uh, I have to admit, uh, I actually thought that the whole idea of following people and then wanting them to follow you back was kind of, you know... Uh, like superficial that those people following you back wouldn't be perfect or something but uh actually the way that i've approached mine so far is that i just keep tweeting stuff and i i hit hashtags where there's a lot of conversation Mm -hmm. and then i engage that conversation and people just start following me back and i don't follow them back Mm -hmm. i i just kind of uh hope that they'll want to stick around for all the awesome (laughs) messages and so i have 1500 people that actually want to hear what i have to say but um, but you you know, it'd probably look a lot smarter if I guess I went off and just found 2000 people who'd happily follow me back. Right. Yeah, I think so. I think it makes sense. Like whoever's following you to follow them. Uh, I think it's kind of a act of respect, um, that, uh, you follow, uh, people who follow you back. It's kind of like this, uh, golden rule I keep talking about in the other podcast episodes. It's like, do unto others as you want to have done unto you. So, uh, if you want to have a lot of follower, uh, following, uh, follow, uh, as I know it's confusing with followers and following and followership and things like that. But if you want to have a lot of people following you, then you should actually follow them back as well. That's my rule of thumb with all social media is like uh, to, to some degree, I mean, obviously you don't want to follow everyone who follows you because some might be, uh, there's this term called bots, which are basically just automated uh, things. They're all obviously like uh, spammers and uh, you can tell, uh, you can usually tell by the description. Some descriptions will say things like, buy 10,000 Twitter followers for just $5 or our service is amazing. Buy, buy followers. So these kind of accounts, I actually don't follow them back because I know their whole purpose is just for you to uh, um, um, pay them money to get followers. And obviously some who are like maybe international in a different language. And uh, I, 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 I actually look at the descriptions really rapidly and I just go through my um, uh, Twitter followers uh, people follow me about once a week. Um, you know, I don't have a set uh, time in my calendar allocated for it, but around once a week, I'll just look through my people who followed me. I'm like, okay, uh, are these people in my niche? Are they having similar passions to me? If I see anyone who has a dad blog, because I have a dad blog called daddyblogger.com, I'm like, hey, okay, this guy's a dad blog. This girl, this lady's a mom blog. This, this is another Vancouver blogger. So boom, 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 follow, follow, follow. Now, this one, this person's writing about social media or SEO or internet marketing, follow, follow, follow. Uh, these are Vancouver-based companies, and I'm based in Vancouver, BC, Canada, so follow. Uh, so that's how I do mine. And if there's someone in a different language, I'll probably just ignore them. If they're trying to sell me stuff, I'll ignore them. If they're trying to spam me, then I'll block them. So I have a, some kind of strategy in terms of filtering the people who are following me. Right, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so you're using uh, Hootsuite to manage your Twitter then? or? Uh, no, actually, I don't, uh, Daniel. I'm glad you asked me that question. I actually use uh, a couple of different uh, tools. Uh, firstly is on my smartphone, uh, I, whether you have an iPhone like me or a BlackBerry or Android. Uh, they have a Twitter app. And on your Twitter app, uh, it's pretty easy to manage on the go. And I'm very much about on the go, you know, in the middle of... Uh, uh, a point in the midst of appointments or meetings, um, I'll use my Twitter app on my phone, and uh, especially at live events. I think that's where uh, Twitter really shines uh, at live events, which I actually produced a lot of them, Daniel, as you know. So, and Daniel's actually spoken at quite a few of my events, and uh, we co hosted an uh, email mastery workshop, and he's spoken at uh, one of my blog mastery conferences. So, uh, we, we do a lot of events together, Daniel and me, and uh, 
uh, they're all based in Vancouver, BC, Canada, but we also do some uh, online stuff through uh, webinars and through podcasts, stuff like that too. So uh, uh, with these events, obviously, it makes sense to be on Twitter and tweeting away because sometimes there's an incentive for the best tweeter, gets a, you know, a prize, or uh, it's good to engage with other people at the live event because uh, it might be a big room. And you can't actually walk across the room and meet each and every person, but you can actually follow them on Twitter and engage with them during the event uh, or the workshop or the conference. So I find that uh, live events, Twitter is a really good tool. Um, I also use, obviously, my laptop and desktop uh, as well. I find it a little bit easier just to look at uh, the whole uh, screen and then look at all the followers. It's a little bit uh, bigger screen, obviously, so it's a little bit easier to manage in terms of my followers and followerships. Um, so it's a combination of... Um, my laptop, desktop, and uh, tablet or mobile. I personally don't use Hootsuite that much. Um, I know Hootsuite's a Vancouver-based company. I'm a big advocate of Ryan Holmes and what he's done for the Vancouver tech industry. Uh, I uh, I like the, something called real-time engagement. I don't do a lot of schedule posts anywhere. Uh, I know uh, it's a different rule of thumb. Some people like doing schedule posts and uh, having a tweet go out like 20 times a day uh, on schedule I personally do it mostly in real time, honestly. Like, uh, uh, if you see my tweets, it'll be actually me tweeting at a certain time. I don't auto, I don't auto post or auto schedule. Um, but some people do. So it's different rules of thoughts around that. My my rule of thumb is the real time engagement, uh, tweeting in real time. Some of the people have the philosophy of like uh, scheduling it, or you can do the hybrid, which is a scheduling and real time uh, kind of a hybrid model, Daniel. That makes sense. Yeah, what do you do, Daniel? Do you actually uh, tweet in real time or do you do schedule posts or do you use Hootsuite yourself? So I have a plan where I like to uh, post probably three or four times a week uh, and I strategically pick uh, things that content marketers and, and you know coaches, authors, speaker, trainers would like. I, I use those, those hashtags, I follow those hashtags and I kind of jump into the conversation once in a while. And I just use the Twitter app. I mean, uh, you know, I just, I just, uh, you know, it's really weird. I find that uh, on the iPhone, even with the latest version, I find the Twitter app can be glitchy at times. So every once in a while, I'll switch over to the, just the browser-based app in Safari. Yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Sometimes the Twitter app can be a little bit um, um, wonky. And then uh, I, I don't usually switch. I just kind of wait till the app gets... I sometimes turn off my phone on and on, and sometimes I just wait for it to uh, function normally again. But uh, that's a good solution. I like that. You can actually just uh, go to the browser directly on um, your, your Safari uh, or your uh, Google uh, uh, URL on your phone. Yeah, like I don't know about you, but I kind of get a little excited when I see my, uh, <laughs> my posts getting like you know, seven likes or 20 <laughs> retweets or whatever. It's happened to me a few times. And Amazing. I, I struggle to get 20 retweets. I might get one or two, and I'm happy, man. So if you can get more than one or two uh, on Twitter, you're doing well. Yeah, So, but when those happen, like, the weirdest thing is sometimes I click notifications, and not all the notifications are in the app, but hmm. they're in the browser. So, so yeah, so, so, I mean – this is a kind of a natural segue. You've kind of touched on strategy, building up the following, managing things. But like when it comes to the engagement, um, I know for me, like when I do the at reply thing and when I follow hashtags, those are kind of my, my two easiest ways to get some engagement. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned hashtags. Uh, for those of you who are listening who are maybe not familiar with the term hashtag, it's a way of aggregating um, tweets or Instagram posts or Facebook posts around a common word. So uh, uh, things like a geocentric uh, hashtag would be like Vancouver or NYC, New York City, or LA or uh, Toronto or wherever you are in the world, right? You can uh, um, just uh, go to hashtag Sydney or hashtag Cairo or hashtag uh, Turkey or Istanbul, right? And then you'll see all the people who are uh, tweeting about a certain topic. So obviously Orlando, there was a recent... Uh, uh, tragedy that happened there. So a lot of people are tweeting about uh, Orlando or I love Orlando or like uh, uh, we're with you, Orlando. Those kind of hashtags will be really popular at the moment because of what happened in Orlando recently. Um, you know, if there's a big World Cup thing like this or Olympics thing like there's in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, uh, then obviously that will be trending or that will be very really popular. So it's a geocentric hashtag. Uh, then there's also topic centric hashtag. So like social media would be a topic centric hashtag or uh, business or entrepreneurship or uh, blogging or um, um, food or uh, foodies or 
uh, travel. Those are kind of topic-based or industry-based hashtags. Um, so there's the kind of the geography-based ones, and there's industry or business-related ones. And uh, uh, kind of what, what I, I I use the term it's called piggyback marketing. And feel free to Google it. But basically, piggyback marketing means you're piggybacking off a popular hashtag. And uh, obviously, around the Olympics or the World Cup then you can piggyback off that hashtag, uh, you know, like uh, 2016 Olympics or 2014 World Cup or things like that, right? Um, a hashtag around those uh, kind of trending uh, hashtags um, during the, the famous um, events throughout the year, like the Academy Awards or the Oscars or the Golden Globes or, um, you know, Much Music or MTV Music Awards, right? Those are obviously hot global uh, topics. Uh, I, I, where As we record this uh, podcast, we're in the midst of a U.S. presidential election, so there's obviously the two front runners, runners, the Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton on the Republican and Democratic side. So obviously that's a hot topic, not just in the U.S., but across the border here in Vancouver, B.C., Canada, and across Canada and all across the world, because whatever the U.S. does uh, affects the world, uh, because we live in kind of a U.S.-centric world right now, so uh, America-centric. So obviously um, uh, American politics is going to affect global politics. Um, uh, other hashtags could be like, um, you know, like the FIFA or, um, you know, like there's so many ones, but I think I just, I, I, I wanted to rattle off a few of the common ones. Uh, and then obviously like if you're on social media and Twitter, obviously there's going to be hashtags around Twitter or social media. So I would say to get engagement is to, um, tweet and piggyback off of popular hashtags. And the other way to get engagement is actually to engage with others. Again, the golden rule of thumb. For so golden rule of social media, which is uh, like, comment, and share other people's stuff. Um, you know, do unto others first, and they'll do back to you. So what I would do is, um, and I do this actually. I retweet other people. I like, or it used to be called favorites. It's changed to likes now. Um, it's basically favoriting something. Uh, I know on Blab it's called kudos, kudos, kudos giving someone a kudos. <laughs> uh, and on Facebook, it's obviously the, all this emoticon reactions as the like or the the laughter, the anger, the sadness. Uh, so the, the Facebook has the emoticons, uh, Blab has the kudos, uh, Periscope has the hearts, and Twitter has the favorites, which are now called likes. Um, so if I like other people's tweets, if I um, retweet other people's tweets, if I do it frequently, consistently, consistently, if I engage with other people's tweets by responding to them, guess what's going to happen back to me, Daniel? And all to the listeners, guess what's going to happen? People are going to retweet me. They're going to like my tweets. They're going to engage with my tweets because I've first done it to them. So that's my rule of thumb, Daniel. Um, um, you know, first like and then uh, tweet and engage with other people. And uh, it's a really simple philosophy, Daniel. It's like if I do to others, people do it back to me. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Do you have any strategies yourself about how you get engagement uh, uh, through your Twitter following? Yeah, so um, I like to, uh, what do they call it, ask uh, sort of hot, engaging, sort of uh, very emotional type things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like, for example, you know, one of my favorite TV shows was canceled. And so... I now, which, one, which one is that? Nashville. Oh, yeah. And so it was one of my favorite shows. And my wife and I watched it religiously every time it came on on Wednesday nights. And uh, I tweeted Lionsgate Television, and I was like, "So, tell us what us fans can do to, you know, to uh, to help convince you guys to bring it back." And and of course, uh, you know, we were able as fans to get about 180,000 signatures, and uh, uh, and the television show was brought back. Mm -hmm. But um, but when I tweeted that, like, at all these people that were replying, so. I mean, whenever you go on those sort of hot topics or, or you engage those kind of questions on hashtags that are, you know, like, uh, you know, like the hashtag bring back Nashville got about uh, mm -hmm. 400,000 retweets, mm -hmm. 400,000 tweets mentioning that hashtag. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't even know uh, until like a couple of years ago that there's actually like professional hashtag research tools, <laughs> um, you know, that you can use. So. You know, I mean, for me, like just engaging them is, you know, either doing the reply or just saying things in that general space where, you know, there's there's these certain things you can say in an audience, right? Where, um, you know, if you're in this, uh, you know, say you're in a crowd of beer drinkers, right? And you walk in with a shirt that says, I smuggled some beer into work today with my stomach, you know, 
everybody would <laughs> laugh and be like, "Hey, awesome T-shirt!" You know, like I I invented this uh, this thing once called the uh, the flag waving technique for social media. I've got fan pages that have had seven hundred and eight hundred shares on their on their images, and I had this theory that if you put the right words on a flag, everybody in a big mob of an audience would happily wave that flag with you. And so the theory is that if I walk into a room of Nashville people and I have a sign that says bring back Nashville, everybody would happily wave it with me. Absolutely. And if I walked into a room of podcasters and, uh, you know, and I had a T-shirt that I was giving away that said podcasting is the answer, how many people in that room would want that shirt? Uh, you would be swarmed by people who are running after you trying to get that shirt. Right. So that's my engagement strategy is to basically, um, you know, figure out what that person or that audience would want. Like, you know, being in a room full of uh, farmers and having a T-shirt that says nothing runs like a John Deere or something, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, or uh, what do they call it? Uh you know, maybe if I was uh, at a Chevy dealership and I walked in with a shirt that said, on a quiet night, you can hear a Ford rust. <laughs> you know? Th those are the kind of th ways that I engage it. I just think of what their hot buttons are and what that audience wants, and uh, and you talk about that. Love it, love it, Daniel. I love how we're adding some humor into the mix here for all of the podcast listeners. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, hashtag uh, comedy with Dan and Ricky or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, we could, we could probably get it uh, going even funnier, but I mean, I'm trying to, you know, say some things that are kind of liberal, but you get the idea, right? Um, it's not just the comedy. It's like you know, these audiences all have, you know, uh, hot buttons, uh, passions, and beliefs around their stuff. You know. Mm hmm. Absolutely, and I think that's kind of like what I was talking about—the payback marketing. So uh, if you say uh, go go into a room of podcasters. I love JLD, and everyone else will be like, "What is JLD?" But the podcasters will be like, "Oh, John Lee Dumas, uh, or you know, Pat Flynn, or Smart Passive Income." So I think if you kind of like piggyback off, com um, if you're in a podcasting room, pod uh, um, I guess leveraging famous podcasters. If you're in a room full of entrepreneurs, leveraging Robert Kiyosaki, and um, you know, like um, all of these famous business people, like Gary Vaynerchuk or Seth Godin, right? So I think it's a, uh, it's kind of like piggybacking, uh, piggyback marketing. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so say we've got these people; they're all engaged. You know, we've we've built up a, a nice little following, and uh, you know they're what do they call it? Retweeting and liking all of our stuff. How do we take that following and turn that into actual sales? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's the whole point, Daniel. So as business owners, um, we're in it to make money, but not just make money for the sake of making money, but but for the sake of serving people. And um, the way we serve people is firstly creating a strategy on how to serve them, and then uh, building up a following of people who who believe in what you're doing, and then uh, engaging that following and managing the following through like Hootsuite and Twitter app and uh, uh, Twitter list and things like that. And then finally, it's converting uh, the Twitter following into paid customers so that you can pay your mortgage and pay your rent and uh, go and travel and uh, buy a nice car and serve people. Because at the end of the day, as, uh, selling is service. That's my philosophy on uh, uh, conversion and uh, basically my philosophy on business is when you sell stuff, you're actually serving people. So like Apple or Steve Jobs, uh, by him selling me an Apple phone, he's actually serving me because that Apple phone helps me manage my Twitter better, helps me communicate with my wife and children, helps me manage my photos better. So Steve Jobs uh, or anyone in the world, when they're selling stuff, they're actually serving their customers. So how do we serve our customers uh, who are, in this case, Twitter followers? So firstly, I think it's adding, um, you know, uh, uh, creating valuable content, uh, engaging them, connecting with them, um, and then um, basically is uh, converting through, I, I, I call it the two acronyms. One is the CTA, and the next is the CRO. So let me explain my conversion strategy. The CTA is your call to action. And every tweet or like um, every um, um, most of your tweets or at least uh, one tenth of your tweets should have a call to action. Uh, you don't want to be overdoing it. Like you don't want to be saying uh, buy my book, buy my course, uh, sign up to my conference every tweet. Because guess what's going to happen? You're going to be marked as a spammer. People are going to probably block you. People are going to unfollow you because that's not serving, is it? Um, serving is basically adding value, teaching them about um, you know things that you're talking about on Twitter, and then 
uh, saying if you would like to take this conversation further, if you'd like to uh, uh, learn more, then you can buy my product, which could be a multitude of products, everything from an online course to a membership site to Skype coaching to a mastermind to uh, online group uh, coaching to, um, you know, live events. It could be actual physical products. It could be services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? The list is endless. But I think the, the whole philosophy is uh, serving first, calling, uh, making sure you're doing call to actions because, the other flip side is people just keep uh, tweeting, 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 and they never actually do any call to action. So that's uh, equally uh, a, a fallacy. Like a fallacy is t- selling too much, but uh, um, you know the kind of the converse fallacy is selling too little. So selling optimally is kind of the way to go, which is kind of different for every person. You know, for you, you can figure out what works best for you. It might be one out of tw- every ten tweets could be a call to action, or uh, maybe uh, every other one. So I. I don't want to really um, uh, put a rule like, okay, one out of 10 or one out of five or one out of two. You got to judge it based on your own business and your own content strategy and your own number of tweets. What percentage of those tweets should be sales based or or call to action based? Um, So that's the first thing I would say, call to actions, uh, directing them back to your course or a a website or um, whatever you're selling, your sales funnel. Uh, And the other thing is your conversion rate optimization. So CRO. Uh, so when you're sharing on Twitter and you're, uh, um, um, you know, um, uh, promoting stuff, marketing and selling stuff, you got to figure out what's your conversion rate. So you can track that through things like Bitly, B-I-T-L-Y. And again, I like to uh, offer valuable um, tools to our listeners here. So if you aren't using Bitly, I highly recommend it. It's a way of tracking how many people are clicking on a URL. So if you use like a long hash, a long URL, it probably won't even fit in your tweet. So it's in a way, it's good to use something like tiny URL or a Bitly, which is a small URL that's maybe 10, 15 characters instead of like 25, 30, 40 characters. Um, so, and also when people click on your Bitly link, um, and there's also Auli, by the way, uh, shout out to uh, Hootsuite. So they have an Auli link, which is similar to Bitly. Um, y- if you click on it, you can actually track how many people have clicked on it. And when they go to your site, you can obviously track how many people have bought something. Um, the, so the other thing is basically to uh, track it on uh, uh, using a promo code. Um, so what I and I'll give you a quick case study of what I just did recently did. I can actually give you two quick case studies here of how I made money or how a company I worked with made money. Um, the first case study is this. I was uh, recently putting together a big conference called Social Media Mastery, and uh, it's very connected to this podcast called Social Media Mastery, the podcast. Uh, so Social Media Mastery, the conference, uh, it was a conference here in Vancouver, BC, Canada with 300 plus people, uh, amazing event. And we actually sold tickets through Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Blab and Google Plus and, uh, and my email list and uh, uh, my, uh, my, blog, uh, blog, my blog content strategy. So what I did there is I actually found a way to, con- um, to track my conversions. So I would tweet and I would actually say, um, to get your discount for the conference, use a promo code Twitter. And I did the same with Blab and um, even LinkedIn and uh, Facebook. And I was able to track exactly how many sales I made through Twitter. It wasn't that many. I think we had two Twitter sales. And each of those sales was like normally 197, but with Twitter promo code, it was 97. So we made 200 bucks through Twitter, which is all right, because most people make zero dollars with Twitter. And I was able to make an extra couple hundred uh, through Twitter, which is uh, not a bad deal um, through uh, just tweeting and using a promo code to track my conversion rate. Um, The other case study I want to quickly share, Daniel, is a company I worked with uh, in Squamish, uh, which is a suburb here in Vancouver, BC, Canada. Really beautiful, by the way. If you ever come into Vancouver, I highly recommend going up to Squamish and Whistler. Uh, so I was out in Squamish, and I was at this uh, big conference called the Canada Internet Marketing Conference, and I was staying in the Sandman Hotel, which is a big chain of hotels uh, here locally. Uh, so the Sandman Hotel, I was staying there. I got a complimentary stay as a blogger, and um, I was actually just doing some media coverage for them. I was tweeting about them. I was doing some Instagram posts. I was uh, doing some uh, Facebook uh, videos and YouTube videos and um, you know, kind of like a video from my room, etc. And all I did is I just tweeted and I, t- I tweeted about the swimming pool. And I said, isn't it awesome that we're here in Squamish and my kids can go in, uh, for a swim inside the Sandman Hotel? What happened is one of my friends, Victor Thomas, um, he actually gave me permission to share the story, by the way. Victor uh, Thomas, uh, who lives in Vancouver, um, responded to that tweet saying, hey, uh, that looks amazing. We're looking to do a, a, a trip to Squamish, and uh, how is the stay? Do they have any deals? 
So Samir Hotel was really on the ball. They retweeted to, uh, uh, back to him and they said, actually, yes, Victor, we do have a special uh, click here to sign up. Guess what happened? Victor, uh, Victor uh, booked a room and Samir Hotel made some money and I did my job as the blogger marketing for them and Victor got a great rate in the Samir Hotel. So that was another case study of a business who was really on the ball, who, who, who connected with my follower and uh, they sold and actually served my follower and everyone's happy. So those are two case studies of how we made money on Twitter and how we uh, did call to action. Uh, we did the conversion rate optimization and we made money. That's awesome. You know, I actually have a case study to share. Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. So, and you can actually look this up too because obviously Twitter's public and everything. Mm -hmm. Literally last week, um, somebody was listening to the McMaster Method podcast, which he tweets and podcasts about autoresponders and systems like that. And this guy sends me a tweet saying, how much for one of your email servers? And, you know, and how do I order one? And I was like, this, this can't even be real, right? So I tweeted him back and I tweeted my Skype ID because I was like, well, who cares if that's public? Um, I can always approve or deny anybody I want. And, uh, and the guy added me on Skype and said, uh, this is my company. We have a, you know, fairly large company. This is our challenge that we're stuck with. And, uh, you know, what can we do? Mm. And it literally became a paying customer, a fellow in Chicago named Andrew. Cool. Um, and so they literally sent me a tweet, found me on Twitter and, uh, and we started engaging back and forth on Twitter and that turned into a client. Awesome. There you go. See, so it's very possible that people are skeptical about, you know how we started the podcast today? Is Twitter just like tweeting out into outer space and no one's responding and it's uh, your tweets being lost and maybe an astronaut might eventually find it? <laughs> uh, but, but, but look what happened. I mean, uh, these are real examples of real money and real customers uh, buying real products and services and uh, tweets actually leading to, to conversions. So, I love those examples, and if the listeners uh, who are listening want to share some examples, why didn't you tweet at us? Tweet at us uh, your case studies or, uh, you know, uh, comment and uh, let, let us know. We'd love to hear some Twitter conversion stories. Yeah, so, uh, Ricky, your uh, Twitter handle is... Uh... Tokyo Ricky. Tokyo Ricky and mine is in Japan and that's why I just I like to give uh, the reason behind my handle is I lived in Japan I was teaching English and that's why it's Tokyo and my first name is Ricky so it's very easy it's just the city Tokyo and uh, my first name Ricky and Tokyo Ricky is actually consistent across all of my social media platforms so what I would recommend just kind of as a little segue here is that uh, whenever you create your social media handles uh, always try to create consistency across your personal brand which mine is like daddy blogger or in this case Tokyo Ricky and uh, make sure you follow uh, myself and also Daniel. What's yours, Daniel? It's just uh, Daniel Dayet. So yeah, see that's easy. It's his first name and last name combined. So uh, it's a good. Uh, it's a good. Uh, that's a good. A good way if you have a common name. Uh, if you have a unique name such as Daniel Dayet, uh, make sure you uh, create a username that's unique and easy to find on all the platforms. So yeah, follow Daniel. Follow myself. Awesome. Uh, well, Ricky, I think we're uh, reaching the end of this. Uh, so. Maybe we should kind of talk about uh, our plan for the next episode. Let's do it. I mean, I think what, we, uh, what we've done so far is added a lot of valuable content, and we're open to feedback on what you guys think. Uh, if you uh, Please leave us a review and rating on iTunes. So we're trying to get up to new and noteworthy, so help us out. We'd love, uh, we'd love some reviews, and we'll definitely uh, screen capture those, and we can retweet those reviews out as well. Um, uh, we can actually share those reviews on uh, all of our social media as well. So therefore, you can uh, get some coverage and publicity for your own business and company. Uh, what we're planning to do actually with this podcast going forward is we're covering a whole bunch of different social media platforms. We've already covered Facebook last episode. We're covering tw we already covered Twitter this episode. We're planning the next big one, which is Instagram. And we'll obviously cover uh, LinkedIn and Snapchat and so on and so forth. And guess what? We might actually bring in some experts to talk about platforms such as Snapchat. Um, you know, um, we look forward to uh, uh, connecting with you, and not just on our podcast, but also through all of our social media channels. Make sure you connect with Daniel and his email list and my email list. My email list is just go to daddyblogger.com and you can sign up for my emails. How about yours, Dan? Yeah, and you can obviously sign up for uh, for my emails at uh, emailexpertpodcast.com or at answerswanted.com. There you go. 
All right, Ricky, thank you once again. It has been awesome. We've got some really awesome content. And uh, uh, everybody listening, please tune into the next episode uh, for more awesome social media tips. Thanks to your sponsors, and make sure you leave us a review and a rating, and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Social Media Mastery Podcast. To get more information about strategies, events, sponsors, and more, visit www.smmastery.com.